16-year-old girl, missing without trace. It's almost as she's vanished off the face of the earth. A parent's desperate search. Bex, if you're uh, watching this, please come home. And a terrible discovery. She'd been dismembered into eight or nine different parts. A teenage girl killed for kicks by her stepbrother and his girlfriend. What kind of hatred would make him do something like that to anyone, let alone his stepsister? This is the inside story of the investigation. If I just flag up for the um, recording what this interview is about, it's about the kidnap and murder of Becky Watts. Told through the killer's astonishing police interviews. Are you going to have to read that statement? No. A story of deceit and denial. Just so I'm clear, as far as the kidnap's concerned, you are not aware that Nathan was planning to do that on no. that day? She said, it's outrageous, it's disgusting. I can't believe he would do that. Well, you know, he did, and you helped him. Fueled by a twisted fantasy. Police discovered text messages which were about the abduction of schoolgirls and teenagers. Killed in the family home. I know all the gory details. I still really feel as if I'm watching someone else's family go through it. For any parent, the worst thing that you can imagine is that your child has been traumatically murdered. It's beyond comprehension. This is the story of an innocent girl whose life was taken by a murderer in her own family. He was a perverted killer, and that's what he really is. Friday the 20th of February 2015, Bristol. The skies are clear, but it's bitterly cold. In the St. George's area to the east of the city, a 16-year-old girl, Becky Watts, has been reported missing to the police. Her stepmom last saw her the previous morning. Journalist Carol Malone followed the case. It's any parent's nightmare. Your child is, is not around for a couple of hours and you don't panic, then she doesn't come home for five or six hours and then, then, then you're starting to panic a bit. Becky had disappeared, as had her laptop and phone. The police searched the local area. Becky's friends and family became increasingly worried and Becky's father, Darren Goldsworthy, made an emotional appeal on local radio. I was just so desperate to find her. It just doesn't add up. None of her clothes are missing. Her toothbrush is there, her makeup's still here. This is, this is all I am. She would not leave the house. I've not been able to eat or sleep since she's gone missing. I just need her back home. <laughs> Colin Sutton is a former Metropolitan Police murder detective with years of experience investigating missing persons. She hadn't gone missing before, hadn't had any argument, you know, there were no surrounding circumstances. And in this case, um, it would have been one of those where you think, yeah, this is out of the ordinary, this, this is something we need to look at very closely. After four days, there was still no trace of Becky. Her family were becoming more and more desperate. Her father, Darren, and maternal grandmother, Pat Watts, made a desperate police appeal for information. Bex, if you're uh, watching this, please come home. We love you so much, and whatever, whatever you think, we can, we can sort anything out that matter. Just come home. There are a number of kind of motivations for making these big public appeals. One is the obvious one, that you want thousands of other pairs of eyes and ears looking out for the missing person. You're so loved, and I don't think you believe it. You really are so loved. And look at your poor dad. Please come home, or whoever's sheltering here, do the right thing. Thank you. But also, you can kind of use it to check and to put pressure on those close to the missing person. Because after all, if people go missing and something's happened to them, statistically, we know that those close to the missing person are more likely to have been involved than our strangers. Becky had lived with her dad and stepmom, Angie Goldsworthy, since she was three. Angie's son, Nathan Matthews, Becky's stepbrother, lived with his grandmother. 
Sue Hill is a former Metropolitan Police detective. When you look at Becky's case, she's got a nice family, and Nathan had been best man to his dad at the wedding. That's a very normal kind of family, extended family these days. So I'm sure there was nothing immediately that rang alarm bells, worrying about the fact that it could be someone within the family. What would be the motive? Why would anyone want to hurt Becky? The vicar of St. Ambrose Church, David James, had married Becky's father and stepmother, and also knew her from the school choir. Becky was very shy. I, I, I think she was somewhat withdrawn. But a, a, a bright child, um, kind of a, a bright-eyed child, if, if you know what I mean. It seemed Becky had no reason to run away. To help find her, the police turned to social media, mounting an online campaign under the hashtag FindBecky. The great advantage we've got these days is social media, and that helps. It was out on Twitter immediately, it's all over Facebook, and it actually connects people to the fact that we need to do something instantly. In the space of a few days, the online campaign had reached over two million people. Appeal posters covered the local area. The story was making headlines. Channel 5 News reporter Julian Drucker was sent to Bristol to cover the case. I was able to speak to her family whilst Becky was missing. They put their phone numbers on the missing posters. They were incredibly proactive as that search went on. In the brief moments I spoke to them, you could sense that hope was fading and there really was a feeling that something terrible was, was coming their way. More than 100 people scoured the local area searching for Becky, including her granddad, John Goldsworthy. We'll bring this to a conclusion, whatever way the ball bounces, you know? So we have to just continue now strengthening each other. When the, uh, somebody goes missing like four or five doors down the road from you, it's obviously kind of affects you. So it's so really sad. And obviously we're just trying to do what we can where we can. Tragic. Absolutely tragic. Absolutely devastating. What, what can you say? Every parent in that area would think, there but for the grace of God, which is why they're all out there looking, because they, their worst nightmares are happening to them, and so they knew that Darren and Angie were suffering the worst nightmare any parent can. Despite all the publicity and the efforts of the local community, there are no reported sightings of the teenager or any sign she'd been using her mobile phone. Nobody had seen her. If you then don't find any digital trail from her, then you start thinking, hang on, this, this is looking really serious. Five days after Becky was last seen, her father Darren gave a distraught television interview, supported by his younger brother Joe, Becky's uncle. Be brave, be brave, darling little girl. <laughs> the desperate search for Becky continued. There was still no information about her whereabouts. And we've just got to keep going and keep going now. We'll just keep working. Can't stop. She's got to be fine. She will be fine, because we'll keep looking until we find her. Police investigators began to fear the worst. They expanded the search to local parks and open ground with the help of the local community. We saw hundreds of people coming out here in the days after Becky disappeared, simply looking everywhere, looking behind trees, looking in the grass. They even dredged this pond here in the hope that they would be able to find something. It's always difficult to gauge that moment where you start going from just ordinary missing person inquiries and you start looking for a body. It's a big step to be taken because of the resources that uh, are needed to, to complete it, but it's also a big step for the family and for people who know and love the missing person because, you know, it, it ratchets it up several notches for them. With no sign of Becky, attention turned to the family home and the forensics team moved in. The family were questioned by the police, including Becky's stepbrother, Nathan Matthews, and his girlfriend, 21-year-old Shauna Hoare. This is the astonishing footage of the interview she gave to police. She tells detectives that she and Nathan were in the house on the day Becky disappeared, and she says she heard her leave. I heard stomping down the stairs. That's what made me think that Becky left in a mood. I assumed, you know, she was in a bit of one of her tantrums. 
As a police officer, you want to know who was the last person to see Becky. Well, the last people to see her were Nathan Matthews and Shona Hall. And the worrying thing was, you know, she disappeared apparently and never seen again. Well, I would be wondering what conversation took place, what happened between them. And I'm sure immediately the police officers were thinking, this just isn't right. What if Nathan and Shona aren't telling us the truth? Well, how can we find that out? We can find that out by doing a fine examination of the house, particularly her bedroom, and let's see if there's any trace evidence there, any scientific evidence, fibres, DNA, blood, that sort of thing, that might show that something happened to her there. Investigators were about to make a disturbing discovery. The forensic team searching the house had discovered traces of Becky's blood. They also found Nathan Matthews' fingerprints on her bedroom doorframe. Why was he in that doorframe? Why is that blood um, in that doorframe? Which then leads you to think, well, something happened here. She's either been dragged out and she's held onto that door, or something happened in the house, and that would lead you to be very concerned. Armed with the forensic evidence, on Saturday the 28th of February, eight days since she was reported missing, Nathan Matthews and Shauna Hoare were arrested on suspicion of kidnapping Becky Watts. We cannot say where Becky is at the moment. We are still searching for Becky. There is sufficient information available to us to justify the arrests of those people in custody. The police now had to tell Becky's father, Darren, and stepmom Angie, that her son, Nathan Matthews, and his girlfriend, Shauna Hoare, were the prime suspects in Becky's disappearance. They were so shocked that they said the police were wrong, that they'd got it wrong. It couldn't possibly be the case. They, you know, it was in inconceivable for them to accept that someone so close in their family had committed this, this man who was supposed to be her brother. But if Nathan Matthews and Shauna Hoare had kidnapped Becky, why did they do it? And more importantly, where was she? Bristol teenager Becky Watts went missing on the 19th of February, 2015. The police and local community searched the area for days, but found no trace of her. There's no contact from her mobile phone or her social media accounts with any of her friends, so it's almost as she's vanished off the face of the earth. Forensic investigators had searched Becky's family home and found traces of her blood and fingerprints belonging to her 28-year-old stepbrother, Nathan Matthews. Matthews and his 21-year-old girlfriend, Shauna Hoare, were arrested on suspicion of kidnapping Becky Watts. Nathan Matthews was the son of Becky's stepmother, Angie, who married her father when Becky was 14 years old. To all intents and purposes, this is a modern family, and it was a harmonious one. The obvious problems that you have with teenagers, but nothing out of the ordinary, and a very loving home. Becky had been a shy child, but by the time she was 16, she was gaining in confidence. Her father, Darren, and Nathan's mother, Angie, married in 2013. Becky was a bridesmaid, and her stepbrother, Nathan Matthews, was best man. Local vicar, David James, presided over the ceremony. Looking back at that time, there's, of course, an element of strangeness about it, because you had two siblings seemingly wrapped up in the, the fun of the whole occasion, and, and yet that was followed, as we know, by the awful circumstances of um, 18 months later. Matthews was 12 years older than Becky. He'd been brought up by his grandmother in a village outside Bristol, but had known Becky for most of her life. The other bridesmaid at the wedding was Matthews' girlfriend, Shauna Hall. But just two years after this happy family photo was taken, Becky was missing, and Matthews and Hoare were under arrest. The couple had been interviewed by police before they were arrested. Shauna Hoare had told detectives she and Matthews were at Becky's home the day she went missing and heard her leave the house. Then I heard the front door slam. Um, carried on washing my hands, went into the living room. And then I 
think it wasn't until a lot later on that Angie asked me if Becky had gone out. And I said, yeah, I heard the door go. She must have gone out earlier. I assumed, you know, she was in a bit of one of her tantrums. <laughs> She's laughing and joking and saying, oh, I think Becky just stomped out of the house in one of her moods. And she was giggling. This is kind of weird. Becky had now been missing for 10 days, but police were about to make a breakthrough. After two days of questioning Nathan Matthews and Shauna Hoare, there was a shocking confession. It was the news the family were dreading. Matthews told detectives that he had killed Becky Watts. What was chilling about this was the closeness of Matthews to Becky. What kind of hatred was, li was living inside this man? What kind of horror would make him do something like that to anyone, let alone his stepsister? Nathan Matthews claimed he didn't intend to kill Becky, but that it was a kidnap plot gone horribly wrong. He said he'd wanted to teach her a lesson for not showing enough appreciation to his mother, Angie. Becky's stepmom. And also I came up with the idea to scare her. Because, like, to try and basically make her more appreciative mm -hmm. of life so she'd be more appreciative for other people. She'd be, like, she'd leave things out on the floor of my mum to trip over. And obviously would talk to her. Um, like, the same uh, nasty comments and talk to her like dirt on the floor. CCTV captured Matthews driving to Becky's house on the day he killed her. He'd come prepared to carry out his plan to kidnap her and was wearing a mask to hide his identity. The details of the kidnap plot were very macabre. So on the day that Matthews and Hall went to Becky's house, they had got with them a stun gun, a large suitcase, they had tape, they had handcuffs. So tell me what you thought you were going to do, what your plan was. They obviously stick them in the suitcase. Obviously, um, obviously you've got tape around your mouth so she wouldn't make any noise. I don't want to interrupt you, Nathan, but just one thing, it might be difficult to hear this later. Do you reckon you could speak up a bit? The fact that he was very much unable to look at the detective, that his head was down, that he was covering with his hands quite a lot, was uh, kind of indicative that he was lying. I was thinking of, like, a wooded area or whatever, to obviously take her back out, to obviously still have the mask on. And obviously, like, scare her and, you know, say some of the lines of, you know, you've got to start treating people, um, start treating people better, you know, n not being a bitch or self-centred. Um, and then, like, make a threat of, um, you know, or, you know, or this could happen again or worse or something like that. There is nothing more warped than when you listen to Nathan Matthews discussing why he decided to carry out this kidnap plot. It's infantile. He uses the victim as the problem. It's Becky's fault. She isn't appreciative enough. She isn't as grateful for my mother as she should be. Matthews claimed that as Becky struggled, the mask he was wearing came off. He panicked and accidentally suffocated her. He insisted he never meant to kill his stepsister. He had no choice but to go along with the things that he knew the police were able to prove. And so what he needed to do was construct a story which, given those facts, still showed him in the best light and the, the least evil light in some ways. I thought if I was, you know, able to scare her, and obviously her not be harmed, and obviously be released. Obviously, when she got back, <coughs> She obviously would have been scared and more appreciative of things, as people are. Cliff Lansley is a behavioural analyst and has helped police on many investigations. He studied Matthew's interview and thinks there were clear signs he was lying. If you're telling the truth, you just convey your story. When you're telling a lie, you have to convince the interviewer. And he uses the word obviously 24 times. Obviously, I 
should be able to go into more detail. <laughs> obviously, well, obviously, and also I came up with the idea to scare her. And obviously is an adverb, which is an alternative to telling the truth. And obviously, her not be harmed, and obviously be released. Obviously, when she got back. It's significant that he uses that word 24 times to try and convince the interviewer that I'm telling the truth that this was an accident. The police made yet another discovery. CCTV shows Shauna Hall with Matthews buying cleaning products, rubble sacks and duct tape. But when interviewed, Hall tells detectives that she knew nothing of Matthews' plan to kidnap Becky Watts. Just so I'm clear, as far as the kidnap's concerned, you are not aware that Nathan was planning to do that on no. that day, OK? How do I know that you weren't involved? Again, I shouldn't have any DNA reason to be involved. Looking at the police interviews, to me, the far more cool, collected and calculating member of this couple is Shauna Hall. She claimed Matthews acted alone and said she was disgusted when she heard what had happened. I felt sick looking at him, knowing what he did. And yeah, I didn't always like Becky, but she was a nice enough girl. She was so young. So... She said, it's outrageous, it's disgusting. I can't believe he would do that. Well, you know, he did, and you helped him. But it was, it was, a, it was an act of, you know, it was just... It was kind of Oscar-winning, actually. While Shauna Hoare denied any involvement in Becky's death, Matthews made another chilling confession. He told detectives that after accidentally killing Becky, he dismembered her body and put it into bags. He then asked two friends, Carl Demetrius and Jadine Parsons, to hide them. They said they had no idea what was in the bags. The van used to transport the bags was captured on CCTV. Following Matthew's admission, 12 days after Becky Watts went missing, police found her body in Demetrius and Parson's garden shed. She'd been dismembered into eight or nine different parts. Each of those parts had been wrapped in cling film and with some sort of absorbent material placed around it as well. The object of this was to make sure that the parts didn't decompose quickly and to prevent them from causing a smell uh, so that they would be discovered. It takes a very special kind of person to be able to dismember a body, a very twisted, weird, inhuman kind of person to be able to dismember a young girl's body. The Reverend David James was organising a vigil for Becky when he heard the distressing news. The fact that Becky was dismembered in the way that she was, I, I still, all this time afterwards, just still can't quite come to terms with that. How can this happen? What lay behind the, the, the circumstances? You know, two people brought up, um, to all intents and purposes, brother and sister. So was the killing of Becky Watts by her stepbrother Nathan Matthews some terrible, strange accident, or did he murder her? And was his girlfriend Shauna Hoare innocent, as she claimed? In the days that followed, detectives would discover the true motive behind the crime, a perverted fantasy that the couple both shared. Police discovered text messages which were about the abduction of schoolgirls and teenagers. In March 2015, following a huge police search, the body of 16-year-old Becky Watts was found dismembered in a garden shed in the Barton Hill area of Bristol. For any parent, the worst thing that you can imagine is that your child has been traumatically murdered. It's beyond comprehension. Adding to the family's distress, Becky's stepbrother, 28-year-old Nathan Matthews, and his girlfriend, 21-year-old Shauna Hall, were the prime suspects. These are the recordings of their police interviews. So if I just flag up for the um, recording what this interview is about, it's about the kidnap and murder of Becky Watts. Matthews had confessed to killing Becky, 
but denied murder. The post-mortem revealed she'd been suffocated, but Matthews claimed it had happened accidentally during a bizarre plot to kidnap her. He said his plan was to scare her into being more respectful towards his mother Angie, Becky's stepmother. I don't know if I came up with the idea to scare her, like to try and basically make her more appreciative mm -hmm. of life so she'd be more appreciative for other people. While Matthews had claimed he'd accidentally killed Becky, 21-year-old Shauna Hoare had denied any involvement. As far as the kidnap's concerned, you are not aware that Nathan was planning to do that on that day. So what had really happened? And what motive could Matthews have had to kill his stepsister? Nathan Matthews and Becky Watts had been part of the same family for many years, although they didn't grow up in the same house. Becky lived with her dad, Darren, and Matthews' mum, Angie, in Bristol, while Nathan stayed with his gran four miles away in South Gloucestershire. In the beginning, it appears that everything's OK. They seem to be getting on. But it doesn't take very long for Matthews to become incredibly jealous and incredibly resentful towards Becky, especially when she enters her teenage years. So she's getting quite a lot of support and care from Matthew's mother. And Matthew's absolutely hated this. He definitely felt like she was favoured. And I think that that was something that he used as an excuse to build this aggression and hostility towards her. After school, Matthew studied electrical engineering at college, but dropped out after a year. He began working as a delivery driver and then joined the Territorial Army. Despite his military training, Matthew struggled to control his emotions. One of the things that we know about Nathan Matthews is that he had an issue with his control of anger. He was very impulsive, so he had a low ability to contain himself and acted in a way sometimes that was spontaneous and dangerous. Matthews also developed an obsession with sexual images of teenage girls. Nathan Matthews had an unhealthy interest in pornography in the fact that he had a particular predilection for young girls, so the way that young girls looked in porn. And unfortunately, if you're consistently compulsively watching that kind of porn, it can trigger, if you have the predisposition, you to bring that into reality. When he was 21, Nathan Matthews met Shauna Hall, a teenager who had spent most of her life in care. When she meets Matthew, she's only 14 or 15. Matthews is 21. So she's got that kind of attraction there to, to somebody who's older, somebody who is probably telling her he's going to look after her. And she wants to believe that. She wants that stability. When you think about Nathan Matthews being in a relationship with a 14-year-old when he was in his 20s, that is considered a sexual offence. He is considered a paedophile in our society, and that's for good reason, because he is a mature adult male, and she is a vulnerable and fragile young woman. Nathan Matthews and Shauna Hoare started to share sexual fantasies, and as the years went by, these began to dominate their lives. That's when, really, they were on a path to no good at all. So they became holed up, literally, in one room of the house that they shared together, looking at abuse images on the net, no doubt talking to each other about what they wanted to do to teenage girls. It was always going to end in a dark place, but I don't think you could have predicted that it was going to end in murder. When detectives examined their phones and laptop, they uncovered disturbing evidence of their sexual fantasies. Police discovered text messages which were about the abduction of schoolgirls and teenagers. So this is a couple who are very sexually motivated. But in his interview with police, Nathan Matthews hadn't revealed any sexual motive for killing Becky. He was sticking to his story that he'd accidentally suffocated her during a kidnap plot that had gone wrong. I don't know if I came up with the idea to scare her, like to try and basically make her more appreciative mm -hmm. of life, so she'd be more appreciative for other people. She'd be like grateful that, you know, she wasn't harmed or anything like that. Nathan Matthews very much wanted to avoid any 
uh, links to her sexual motivation. I think given that it was a stepsister and her age, he was very much aware that he didn't want that link to him. So we tried to say it was he was trying to teach her a lesson, that he was trying to scare her into improving her behavior. To teach her a lesson, what rubbish, he was making excuses, trying to deter and detract from what he really was. He was a perverted killer, and that's what he really is. Matthews was also keen to distance his girlfriend, Shauna Hoare, from any involvement. When his confession is read back to him, he asks for her name to be omitted. I just think of everybody. And that, like, obviously she's in, obviously we'll be included in it, but include everybody, I don't say her name. Okay. The way that Matthews reacted in his interview, where he seemed to be wanting to protect Shauna, he, 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 to him, it seemed that the main thing that was troubling him was that he'd got this girlfriend who was considerably younger than him involved in what went on. Uh, obviously, we'll be included in it, but include everybody, I don't say her name. Okay. In her interview, Shauna Hoare stuck to her story that she didn't know anything about the kidnap or killing. But behavioral analyst Cliff Lansley has studied her speech and body language closely and believes it's telling. I'm not sure if he's just kind of lost his marbles or if he's just deeply disturbed without anybody knowing. Mm. She's making a claim that um, nobody knows uh, what really went on. So he's been planning this without anybody knowing, including herself. But when she makes this claim, that without anybody knowing... Without anybody knowing. Mm. We see a single-sided shoulder shrug. When we see a single-sided shoulder shrug with an affirm affirmative statement, is the statement that's being made at the time of that shrug is untrue. Lansley believes Shauna Hoare's choice of words is also telling. How do I know that you weren't involved? Again, I shouldn't have any DNA reason to be involved in, again. There's an interesting verbal content slip here, which could be significant. When we're telling a lie, we have to suppress the truth. There's an indication when she says, there's no DNA reason why I should be involved. Again, I shouldn't have any DNA reason to be involved in, again. Now, where's the word DNA come from? One explanation is that she's pretty convinced that uh, she can't be pinned to the murder and her DNA or blood or fingerprints aren't anywhere to be found. So that could be slippage of the confidence that she's feeling that she can't be incriminated in the actual crime. Shona Hall may have had reason to be confident about the absence of DNA evidence. When police forensic investigators examine the bathroom of Matthews and Hall's home, no traces of Becky's DNA were found. But police did have CCTV evidence of them buying cleaning products at a supermarket 48 hours after Becky was killed. They cleaned up their bathroom incredibly thoroughly, which was actually a bit of a red flag because the rest of the house was so dirty and so cluttered, and yet there was this pristine bathroom that they had bleached to within an inch of their life because of course, they didn't want any forensic evidence to be found. But the way in which Becky's body was disposed of pointed to someone with military training, like that undertaken by former Army reservist Nathan Matthews. Matthews learned skills in the Army that would come in very handy to him when he was disposing of Becky's body. He bought cat litter, which is known to absorb moisture and smells, and it's actually a very good thing to put carefully wrapped parts of somebody's body in because it eliminates the smell. It was precise, it was professional. The police decided they had enough evidence against Nathan Matthews and Shauna Hall. They were both charged with the kidnap and murder of Becky Watts. But when the case went to trial, would the jury believe Shauna Hall's claim that she wasn't involved and that Becky's stepbrother killed her by accident. It is astonishing that, that he, he thought he could get away with that stupid story, that ridiculous defense. He planned it, it was premeditated, and it was vile. 
On April 17, 2015, teenager Becky Watts was laid to rest. Her friends and family were joined by hundreds of the local community at St. Ambrose Church, led by Reverend David James. I wanted to try somehow to bring about a note of hope. I tried to do it by saying, well, we're all here in this place where we don't want to be. How can this event be given some kind of significance and meaning for the future? Well, the answer is that the best memorial, in a sense, is to make this community a better place. Becky's family, including her maternal grandmother, Pat Watts, were still trying to come to terms with their terrible loss. I know all the gory details, and I, I know this, that, and the other. But I still really feel as if I'm watching someone else's family go through it. I'd have loved to see her grow up and have a good life, hopefully. Becky's family was still reeling from the shock that her stepbrother, Nathan Matthews, had admitted killing her. <clears throat> Most murders happen with people that you know, you know. A man kills a girl, there is some connection to the family. He knows the neighbors, you know, whatever. But what was chilling about this was the closeness of Matthews to Becky. He denied murder, claiming it was accidental. He said he had only intended to teach Becky a lesson, and it was a kidnap plot gone wrong. I thought if I was, you know, able to scare her, and obviously her not be harmed, and obviously be released. Obviously, when she got back, <clears throat> she obviously would have been scared and more appreciative of things as people are. So Matthews said he didn't mean to kill her. He was looking for a manslaughter verdict rather than murder with a substantially reduced sentence if that had succeeded. So again, I'm not sure if he's just kind of lost his marbles or if he's just deeply disturbed without anybody knowing. Police also suspected the involvement of Matthew's girlfriend, Shauna Hoare. Just so I'm clear, as far as the kidnap's concerned, you are not aware that Nathan was planning to do that on no. that day. So she's absolutely, resolutely sticking to the fact that I haven't done anything. I didn't know any of this. Again, I don't know if it was just some sort of like sick thing he had in his head and it was just convenience, or if he actually planned specifically all, you know, for months and do this to her, wasn't it? I don't know. No. Paul carried on denying that she knew anything about it at all. Um, one presumes, you know, relying on the assurances she'd been given by Matthews. In October 2015, the trial began at Bristol Crown Court. The prosecution set out their case. They stated that on the 19th of February, Matthews and Hoare had driven to the family home. It was captured on CCTV. They were carrying stun guns and handcuffs with the intentions of kidnapping Becky for their own sexual purposes. They put it to the court that Matthews and Hoare had killed Becky by suffocating her in or near her bedroom after she put up a struggle. The couple then put Becky's body into a suitcase and drove it to their flat in Barton Hill. The court heard that it was here that Matthews dumped Becky's body in the bath and then stabbed her 15 times. He then set about dismembering her body. The prosecution showed the jury damning CCTV evidence. Matthews was seen buying a circular saw, believed to have been used to cut up his stepsister's body. He was cool, he was calm, he was collected. He was actually comparing these tools, the saw tools, and he was actually asking assistants you know, details about the tools and how much they were, which was the cheapest one and which was the strongest one. It, it is astonishing. The jury were told that just hours after killing Becky in her family home and moving her body, they returned to spend the evening with her parents. 
they were sitting in Darren and Angie's house on the day that they killed her, uh, talking to them, eating with them, watching television. That, after they killed her and her body was outside in the car, they're watching Neighbours with Darren and Angie. I mean, I don't know what kind of twisted mind that takes, but it is inconceivable, and that's the particular horror of this. Most people, when they commit murder, they tell you how horrified they were, how disgusted they were, how they couldn't get away from that body quick enough, and, and this is an incredibly rare type of, of post-defense behavior. It really is quite disturbing. That's someone who's a sadistic murderer. That is not someone who accidentally murders someone. After a trial lasting five weeks, the jury was sent out for deliberation. They reached their verdict after just three hours. Becky's stepbrother, Nathan Matthews, was found guilty of her kidnap and murder. The jury clearly rejected his story and his explanation for how the death happened. They looked at the evidence of the text messages and they decided there was a deliberate kidnap of Becky with a view to abusing her, and that's how she was killed. Matthews was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 33 years. Shauna Hall was convicted of the lesser charge of manslaughter and given 17 years in prison. Matthew's friends who owned the shed where Becky's body was found were convicted of assisting an offender. Carl Demetrius was jailed for two years. And Jadine Parsons for 16 months. I struggle to think of a case where the effects on a family have been more horrific and more long lasting than this one. You know, what you've got is you've got a man and his wife, one of them's son kills the other one's daughter in circumstances where there was some sort of murky, distasteful sexual connotations to what was going on. And then to add insult to injury, dismembers the body. How can Becky's father deal with that? I think the relationship between Darren and Angie is, is extraordinary. Most people who experience this kind of thing break up, their relationships break down, but I think what these two have is they've found that strength in each other, um, which is something that's quite rare. Matthews and Hall have now been in prison for nearly two years and will be many more before they're given the possibility of parole. It's reassuring to know that these two individuals are behind bars, that they're not able to harm anybody on the outside. But still, you know, what, what price for, for the life of a teenage girl? Uh, and I think that the question of justice is always one that we struggle with. Both Nathan Matthews and Shauna Hall have had a very tough time in prison. In fact, Shauna Hall has had to be resuscitated on two occasions. That denotes the gravity and severity and brutality of their crime, that even in a place where others are being punished, their actions are considered so despicable that people want revenge. Matthews and Hall may be behind bars, but their terrible crimes ended the life of a teenager with everything to live for. When all said and done, a 16-year-old who had her whole life as an adult in, in front of her was lost. She was the victim of her stepbrother's desires and crazy ideas, really. Becky Watts had her life snatched away by the twisted actions of her stepbrother, Nathan, the very person who should have been her protector. Tomorrow at nine, finding out whether money really does buy happiness as Rich House Poor House returns for a new series here on Channel 5. Next tonight, more true life crime. Five years on, we look back at the events surrounding the Philpot fires.